My name is Penat and I'm with, I will be your MC for the next education session for today. Besides this event here in Bangkok, Infocom also delivers similar events in Beijing and Mumbai for the China and Indian markets respectively. Together, these three events provide access to the largest AV markets in Asia and brings together more than 70,000 attendees, comprising AV professionals and vertical market end users. This event, Infocom Asia, was first launched in 2019 and was disrupted for two years due to the pandemic. It then returned in person in 2022. So this 2023 show is the third edition and we're looking forward to welcoming thousands of visitors all over Asia to discover new AV technologies, explore collaborations and opportunities, and more importantly, rekindle friendships. Without further ado, allow me to introduce, to begin this session by introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Ko, Senior Education Research Scientist and Deputy Director of Research Support, National Institute of Education from Nanyang Technological University. She's an active researcher who has held numerous research grants involving local international academics, school leaders, teachers, and policy officers. Today, she will be speaking on formative learning analytics for lifelong learning. Please welcome Dr. Elizabeth Ko. Hi. Hi, very good morning to all of you. Thank you for spending your morning and afternoon with us today. So it's a very exciting time as you see from the earlier uh, program. And I believe here many of you are not only from Thailand, but from all over the world. So thank you for coming. Uh, so today, uh, as, as I was introduced, uh, my name is Elizabeth and I'm from the Nanyang Technology University in Singapore where I've been doing work in learning analytics. So I know some of you may not be so familiar with learning analytics, so let me just go through what learning analytics is. So learning analytics, this is the most common definition of learning analytics. If you ever want to know a definition of learning, this will be the most common one. And these are by the founders of the field, George Siemens and Dragon Gasovic. So what is learning analytics? Learning analytics is the, you can see I've highlighted two words, data. It's about learner's data. So nowadays, we are, we are using technology in all ways. Like using your camera, you're using your computer. So all, when you use all these different devices, there's data that, that can be used for learning. So learning analytics makes use of that data. And also it helps, the idea is to optimize, optimize learning. So to help improve learning. Okay, so that's the aim of learning analytics. So it measures, collects, analyzes, and reports data about learners and the context, that means the environment, to help optimize learning and environment in which learning occurs. So that's what I've been doing a research on. And in particular, why? Okay, why? So I think some of you are educators in this field. Some of you uh, look at uh, education, right? So why, why learning analytics? I think first we want to ask uh, some of us when we, how do we know whether our students are learning, right? Yeah, how do we measure or assess learning? Okay, some of you might tell me, oh, I, I, I do a quiz, right? I do a quiz, uh, I do assessments, all right? Some of you mark, right? Yeah, see some nods. Yeah, so this is the typical way uh, we can also observe our students, uh, how they actually are understanding what we are teaching. Uh, but in recent years, uh, these are the good ways, and they are, but now with digital technology, there's more and more... Um, types of technology out there and even sensors, right? They are coming in, uh, capturing all sorts of data. So because of this large amount of learning related data, uh, we are actually can harness these data to help us better understand how students learn. So we can look at the characteristics of the data that's coming, the relationships between the learning characteristics and other factors of learning, for example. So this helps us to inform uh, our learning designs, how to inform learning strategies, pedagogies, the instructional design, and so on. Yeah. So in, and I think what's very uh, useful about all of this data is not at the end, but it's the process of learning. So it's looking at the learning progress during learning activities. So it enables us to actually offer this kind of precise and timely feedback 
uh, from learners. And that's what is known as, as students give data to the system and you can actually close this loop of data. It's known as closing the feedback loop that is enabled first by learners giving you data and then you give back the data to the learners to help them in their learning. So that's known as closing the feedback loop. So I'll be looking at this a bit more about closing this feedback loop to uh, what is known as formative learning analytics or uh, formative LA for short. And some of you might be familiar with a formative assessment. Those in the area, in, if you're in education, I think you, you know what's formative assessment as well as summative assessment. I think summative assessment is uh, what's very common. Uh, it, it's our major exams, examinations, right? Uh, in Singapore, we have the O levels uh, for younger learners. You have the university exams. So at the end of the exam, Every time after my exams, I'm very happy because I can always tell my teacher, oh, I, I can throw it away. <laughs> I finish all my exams. <laughs> I don't need to learn this subject anymore. But that's it. Right? After you, you do a summative exam, okay, you can forget, so-called forget about it. Ah, but uh, So that's summative. It's at the end. So the student can't do anything um, about it already because it's, it's, it's at the end of the exam. But what if, but for formative as assessment, the idea is to give feedback to the learner when they are still learning to help them in their learning progress so that they know how they are progressing and what needs to be done. So that's a formative assessment. Okay, So it's similar to formative feedback, but for feedback, we are not really assessing the student. We're not marking them, giving them grades. We're just giving them feedback. So to know, to give you information about where you are in your learning. And so putting all this together with data, formative learning analytics is actually using learning analytics for formative feedback, so during the process of students' learning. So it could be related to their uh, learning interaction on a system, or like a typical online system, or it could be the even the students' disposition, their survey responses, and it helps to identify where students are and to help them uh, determine their own progress that they can continue to learn. So I've been looking at uh, formative learning analytics for the last 10 years or so where I'm in, in the, and I've been doing several projects working with teachers in schools. Uh, so younger learners, they are typically, uh, the teachers teach, uh, or the schools that I work with are in primary school in Singapore, which they are, that means they are uh, as young as primary one, which is uh, seven years old, all the way to uh, primary six, which are 12 years old, as well as secondary schools. And these ages are 13 years old to 16 year old students. So high school for some of you. Um, so I've been working with teachers as well as uh, policy officers or education officers in, in the Singapore Ministry of Education, as well as uh, web developers uh, in my teams, as well as other researchers. Uh, so I've been uh, working with them to develop uh, several tools that are useful for learning using formative learning analytics. And these are two tools that uh, my team and I have developed. The first one is called My Good Work Buddy for Geography, or MGB Joe for short. And the other one is called We Read uh, Plus. Plus because we added stuff to it, new things. Yeah. Um, so I'll be going through two of them uh, quickly because in view of time, I won't be able to share too much, but I'll be sharing with you the brief uh, idea of, of them. Okay, so my group of buddy for geography. Um, it, okay, so actually before this project started, I had my group of buddy. So my group of buddy focuses on from group work. You can see from the name my group work, right? It look at, looks at teamwork. Uh, we all know like teamwork collaboration is very important in, in our world right now. Like right now, I think many of us from different areas, from different uh, uh, disciplines, we have to work in this interdisciplinary teams, or we have to work with people from all sorts of uh, different diverse backgrounds. We have, to work, we have to learn how to work together. So to be a future ready learner, we, we do have to be able to work in teams. Uh, but not only having good teamwork skills, but we do, do need to know some content, academic content. So in this case, our focus is on geography, because uh, one of the projects that we focused was uh, geography. So the idea is to develop a tool that can help uh, students uh, in that process of developing their mastery in geography, as well as teamwork. But in many of the tools out there in computer supported collaborative learning, it's the other focus a bit more on the cognitive awareness. So they focus on how how do I master that concept? How do I understand uh, this this particular uh, either knowledge or this way of thinking? Uh, but they don't so so much focus on teamwork at the same time. 
Then the other tools that focus a lot on social awareness or group collaboration, okay, we, we will how to work together. But there are not many tools that look at both. So this idea of this tool is it tries to do a bit of both, both content as well as social awareness, which is related to uh, teamwork and collaboration. So um, so we, we to build this tool, we took into consideration several uh, what we call techno-pedagogical design considerations. That means uh, using the technology tool, what affordances or what abilities or skills, uh, I mean, uh, uh, affordances of the technology that can be used to design as well as being informed by theory to de design the system itself. So uh, one thing we, we, we uh, got from the literature was that the tool actually helps, needs to foreground and support the whole collaboration inquiry process. And the second one is that they must meet also the psychological needs of the learner. So this is related to the self-determination theory, where the idea is that learners have these three basic psychological needs, autonomy, competency, uh, competence, and relatedness. So because of, uh, due to, uh, based on this, we actually designed uh, this tool called My Global Body for Geography. And you can see here it was carried out in a Singapore classroom. So this is uh, slightly before COVID, that's why they're not wearing masks. Uh, but now they also have taken off their masks in schools. Um, so this is, uh, 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 what we developed it for, uh, this in this case, a 15-year-old, uh, secondary three, grade three students, uh, uh, yeah, uh, three, in, in, uh, in Singapore. Uh, and this was in the project, uh, they had, in Singapore they had to do this uh, subject called uh, geography, which has this uh, component in, of field work, and it's called geographical investigation, or GI for short. Okay, so that uh, so the idea we, we had this group of students we had it uh, we did three trials three trials three because it's a design based uh, research type of project where we have multiple trials uh, so the idea was to develop this uh, tool that is both a system a web based system as well as a curriculum package uh, for the students so if you want to access the tool uh, unfortunately no but you can have the the design uh, resources that we, we developed yeah. Um, so I'll share you some of the limitations later, but this is the way it can be accessed and more information about this project can be accessed. Uh, so we have uh, like the teacher's manual for the student, uh, for the teacher, and then these are the, the guide for the teachers. Yeah. And so this is what uh, we, we produce as the project. And so so what, what happened right in this project? Uh, so this is our research question, and we wanted to help uh, deepen students' geographical knowledge as well as their growth in teamwork. And so we, uh, as I mentioned, we use design-based research and uh, mixed methods to evaluate the, the, the intervention. Uh, and we also wanted to uh, develop design principles uh, to help in this whole collaborative inquiry to meet these goals of academic excellence and teamwork. So I'm not be going through all the findings just in brief. Um, so one of the key principles that is involved is uh, that we that we through the project developed was that uh, there's a need to have a, a holistic collaborative inquiry model for both geography and teamwork learning to bring the, all the models in sense together in, in one holistic inquiry. Uh, so we basically adapted from two models. Uh, one is the team and self-diagnostic learning, TSDL for short, which my team and I have already previously developed. So what this uh, inquiry model for collaboration is, is that students work in teams and then after that, they build their self and teamwork awareness using uh, this. Uh, so there's a teamwork instrument which I'll go through shortly. And then this helps them to build awareness using the visualizations. And then they'll engage in team reflection and sense making to reflect on what uh, their information. And then they monitor their teamwork and change using the, the it's a very simple status check. So this is one. Uh, and this is TSD. Uh, this TSDL is adopted by further uh, theory, theories as shown here. Um, and then, uh, so this is the teamwork competencies that we focus on. Uh, so there's many, many teamwork uh, competencies or dimensions of teamwork. Uh, but we focus on these four. Okay, so these four, uh, I would say they are transportable. And this is also from the visual. That means they can be used across teams, across tasks. Okay, so I, and I've used this measure both for younger learners as well as older learners. Uh, so these uh, four dimensions are first, the first one is coordination to do with handling uh, of information in an efficient manner, complete information and tasks uh, in a timely manner. Second one is mutual performance monitoring to do with checking each other's work. Uh, third one is constructive conflict 
Uh, that's actually quite important, I feel, uh, in Singapore and also in many of the probably Asian contexts where it's very common to hear students say, I don't want to disagree with my friend, with my peer, because I don't want to uh, create conflict or, or disharmony. But we, we wanted to let students know that it's important to deal with differences, to be able to discuss, to clarify, and to have a constructive conflict. Yeah, so that's this third dimension. And the fourth dimension is team emotional support, which I think all of you will know is the camaraderie, the psychological support in a team to help each other bond emotionally. So, uh, so based on that teamwork, uh, uh, so it was actually got, uh, developed to a survey, and then we got students to rate themselves uh, on these four dimensions on a Likert scale one to five, where five was strongly agree, as well as to rate their peers, that means their team members in the same team, uh, one to five. And then the peer ratings were anonymized. Uh, and then you could see it here. And then this is visualized to them in this radar chart, or some people call it a spider chart. Uh, so this is the self in blue. And this is the peer rating average of all the peers in their team uh, in pink here. And students will see this visualization. Uh, and they could also choose it to see in a bar chart or table form. Uh, and this is the team the average of all the, uh, the ratings in that, that team. So what? So this was visualized to students. So this related to the second design principle, uh, making teamwork competency explicit through visualizations in a timely manner. So they would see this uh, in midway during their project as well as at the end of their group project. And another design principle that we looked at was uh, to help them in their teamwork is and also in their uh, inquiry process and geography was to prompt. Um, give them prompts or tips in the whole process. So learning pro prompts with uh, design, uh, especially related to the common pain points that, uh, that, that, we, that we see uh, experienced by students in both their geography, geography content as well as teamwork. And these also we use some of the motivation principles to offer them uh, tips uh, in this. So I'm not going to go through uh, all the details, but uh, th that's the general idea. And I wanted to just quickly go through uh, some of the brief findings. Um, so what, when we designed this whole project, uh, so this is based on the last trial that we did. We had three trials, so the third trial. Uh, so this, this collaborative inquiry model integrated both the uh, inquiry approach of geography and the that team and self diagnostic learning approach. So by its very alignment, it helped the whole, whole uh, project content, the whole curriculum to be very aligned. Um, and, and also combined in a single system, which is the Mandalupali uh, system. So when students thought about geography, they were like, okay, immediately they know, okay, it's Mandalupali for geography. And so this idea of um, this combination of this approach is actually one of the contributions already. Um, so we, we did de depict it as a, it, a linear, uh, but actually one of the, it, it generally in collaboration, it doesn't, have, it doesn't take place so linearly. It's actually very uh, connected, iterative. Uh, so that's one of the current limitations of this model, but it helped the teachers and the students know where they were, what process, what stage, what activity they were in. And also the uh, feedback from the teamwork, uh, this part, where we didn't feedback for their teamwork, uh, as we had certain aspects of their teamwork perceptions that increased uh, significantly. Uh, but it wasn't, I would say, a very large uh, gain in teamwork, but it was still uh, it increased uh, significantly for some aspects. Uh, in terms of students' self-reported geographic uh, knowledge, uh, certain um, the geography knowledge in terms of the procedures, procedures, the processes grew, but not all of the uh, the attitudes. Uh, so, but in general, there was a, the self-reported uh, uh, geography knowledge grew. Yeah. So uh, basically, this I would say the. So the findings were mostly positive, although there were some limitations as seen here. Uh, I think what was very what is important to take away is that the, these design principles that can be used in many of uh, your cases uh, can be useful, and it can also be done in a blended uh, or virtual learning approach. Yeah, so not only uh, it can be basically face to face or in class with some uh, support from technology. Yeah, so this is a quick uh, summary of this first formative learning of the LDX project. I'll go on to my second project, which is called We Read Plus. Okay, so We Read us uh, from the term uh, We will read together. Uh, so it's a collaborative reading and formative learning analytics uh, visualization uh, system. 
Okay, so this is the second phase of the project where the first prototype was done earlier in 2015 to 2019, uh, was used in English language in Singapore, and there was a lot of interest to carry on this project, not only for the secondary school population, but to try out in different educational contexts. So this uh, project now is going to be, is um, what I'll be sharing with you is how it was trialed in both uh, in the primary school, younger learners as well as a pre-university, this is junior college, and a graduate course, that means in tertiary education. But the idea of this tool is to address the, the some of the challenges in uh, the lack of dialogue or informative feedback, and wants to actually help uh, promote reading as a uh, rich social practice to allow students to take different perspectives and to actually uh, in, help in their own self-regulation and critical reading skills. So that's really the lifelong learning. So this is the pedagogical model of uh, ReRead Plus. Uh, it's actually, uh, my, my colleague was the first first author, Jennifer Tan. So she's the, I would say, the, the uh, she, she and I, well, mostly her, came up with this part, where it's, uh, the background is computer supported collaborative learning. And then uh, assessment for learning provides uh, the aspect of giving some feedback and we want students to dialogue with each other, so dialogic learning. And also uh, the idea of multi-literacy where it uses uh, literacy in the practice of, of the, the context that you are in, uh, in short. So this is the Theragun model and now I'm going to how the system looks like. Uh, so the first part, uh, if you are familiar with Peruso, uh, this commercial software, it looks a bit like Peruso. Uh, it, uh, it allows you to annotate. So here you can see uh, this text, it's a text, and then you can highlight, and then after you highlight, you can annotate, you can write something about it, and you can reply to other students. Uh, and what's a bit particular, special about ReRead uh, is that we, uh, we have two tags, two sets of tags. This set of tags, uh, one is related to the, it could be, so it's not, it's customizable. It's really related to something to do with critical thinking. So in this case, um, our we use we used Paul's view of critical reasoning to actually come up with uh, some of the tags that students use, and this helps to uh, activate students' thinking as they as they annotate and as they reply. So that's the first set of tags. The second set of tags is related to uh, how they are collaborating. So such as whether I agree, disagree, I want to clarify uh, these kind of tags. So that's this first part um, of the system. And the second part is the to do the formative feedback. Okay, so we provide a dashboard to them, a learner dashboard as well as a teacher dashboard. Well, this is a picture of the learner dashboard, which provides a dynamic formative learning uh, based on the tags. I mentioned the two sets of tags. And this is shown to them uh, as a radio chart as well as a bar chart. And they also it tracks their progress, how many, uh, I, how many posts have they posted on the system. And then so they have uh, received some likes and badges, this will collate the total number of, of them. Uh, but what, what is quite important here is this part of, uh, to let students know, in terms of the tags they have used, uh, what have they used more? So in this case, this student has used a lot of purpose, a lot of assumption in the post, in tagging, uh, in writing those uh, points earlier. Um, and this part, this person, this student has used a lot of clarifying, for example. And so you can see there are some areas that the student has not used right, at all. So this actually is an area for students to actually uh, know where he or she is, is uh, you has used a lot more and to actually try these other areas in their, uh, in their, in their annotation and uh, replies. And you can see here there's a reflect and set goals uh, for actually for them also to reflect about their, what they have seen in their uh, information here on their dashboard. So, uh, so this is uh, one part of the research where we actually tried to find out how do these three new contexts uh, uh, use reread in their in their own respective causes, and so we wanted to find out what's the perceived uh, the how how ready it, they were, uh, how is reread ready in the sense of its perceived of use and usefulness for learning. So um, you see, this is a thematic analysis. We are focusing on a thematic analysis here, uh, where we're using codes and uh, it was uh, basically coded and then cross, uh, there was a cross case analysis performed. So you see these later on, you see P, J, and T. P stands for the primary school, the J, the, the pre, pre U, and then T is the tertiary institute. So I know this is a very uh, a full full slide, uh, of, but this is really how it was implemented in the, these three cases. Uh, for the primary school, it was uh, over three in-class sessions. Uh, so across three weeks, 
and they used three different texts. One, two were newspaper articles, one was a poem, and these were the, uh, the customized sets of tags used. So one was a top moves, and the other one's a literary devices. So if you're familiar with English, this is a very, uh, I'll say, they, they use this a lot more English language to help students, and as well as literature to help students understand some of the concepts uh, in, in reading and also writing. Uh, and then, uh, so basically, the teacher was going to introduce the tags, and, uh, but the, they actually use tags that students are familiar with already, that they have been using in the curriculum. And then also the teacher uh, used the teacher's dashboard to see what the students were doing and, and, the, they, and asked the students uh, basically to use the learning dashboard at their own time. Uh, for the junior college, it was, um, it was uh, reread was used as homework, and that, but the teacher introduced uh, that reread in class. And then during class, the teacher had an uh, in-class discussion about what they did as, as homework on Riri. And they used these lenses. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so the teacher used the dashboard a lot to monitor students' progress. And the students were informed about their dashboard, but they didn't really use it much. Uh, and the last one was the Tertiary Institute. Uh, we had two in-class sessions and in between one e-learning session. Uh, and we had two book chapters. So they're pretty long. Um, and then these were the, the tags used. And uh, students were informed of the dashboard, but there was no explicit instructions about it. Um, so these are the brief cost, cross case analysis findings that are definitely have more. Uh, you can, if you like to read more, this is a published work here where we wrote about it. Um, so there are three themes that we uh, identified uh, for this sharing will be the first one uh, to do with dashboard visuals. And second one was about how the prompts promoted the thinking. And the third one is about collaborative knowledge building. So I'll go through each one with some examples. Uh, so I know this is a, a wordy slide, uh, but in short, uh, what we found was about, about the dashboard metrics or the visuals was that the bar chart was generally well perceived by participants as they were easier to integrate than the radar chart. Uh, but for the lights and badges, uh, uh, these were, uh, were received mixed responses from the participants. Uh, some students saw its benefits. Uh, many of the primary school participants, they, they liked the like. I think for our younger learners, they really like liking people's posts. Uh, but for the older learners, um, sometimes it feels like sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't help. Yeah. Uh, the tertiary learner said that I think sometimes it's fine. I can see the merit. It's it's good for the kids, but for myself, this person was like, I'm old, <laughs> I don't really not really concerned with the likes. Um, yeah, similar for the junior college students, say I can foresee it being useful for some people, but not all students. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what you can be seeing is that certain metrics like the likes seem to appeal to certain groups of people more than other, like older learners. That's what we, uh, what we see. And in terms of the bar charts and the dashboard visualization, it generally helps to, uh, uh I mean, they, they generally like that it was easier, uh, that there, there were bar charts for them to more easily uh, interpret the, what they were looking at for the information. Okay, the other finding was related to the method called the prompts. Uh, so these were the, the sets of tags that, uh, that we read had. Um, so this was actually help them uh, in general. Um, uh, some students found that they, were, they helped to promote thinking. So this really helped to activate their thinking. Okay, uh, yes, I see you. There's not much time left, uh, but there were some students, they were uncertain if they had used the correct tags in their responses. Um, and then some they didn't feel that was necessary. Um, so you could see that students, uh, it was helpful, but yet they were not sure how to respond to these tags. Yeah. And the third uh, point that I have to move on is to do with uh, facilitating collaborative knowledge building. Uh, so it, it was the way that uh, this tool is designed helped them to actually reply to each other, and they found that the the rich and productive discussions from each other online. So more so in sense, the online discussion, the dialogue, uh, which because they could uh, do it on their own time, and sometimes it's even more than face to face time. They could actually hear from each other's perspectives more. So in general, they found that um, there was a lot of uh, conversation going on. So this conversation already helped to them to hear from different perspectives. But at the same time, some of the perspectives were less divergent than we hoped that it would be. So what is uh, some discussions uh, implication is that there are some strength of the system as well as concerns. Um, but what we generally found was that the students' confidence and the teachers' confidence also increased over time when they're more confident to use the tags and more confident to use the system. And that also the dashboards do not have a uh, same effect for all learners, so there's no one size fits all dashboards. Um, but definitely, these findings are limited to our unique contact in Singapore and a small sample size. So, um, but we do see that it 
in general, these kind of tools take time. Uh, very different from like the use of a typical uh, technology or lifestyle tool where you can just uh, you sort of need a, a so for initial tools it might take time to enculturate students in learning in this way but it's still a useful tool to help promote the 21st century competency of students especially critical thinking and going to my last slide yeah um, so just to sum up the to both these tools for my group Bali as photography as well as UE plus is that they provide formative feedback to learners in terms of these digital Learning data of their learning progress. You can see it's not really at the end, but during the course of their, during the course of their learning, and these are visualized in some way to charts or to help them summarize to provide them with personalized feedback because it's already off of their own the data. It's very personalized to them. And one thing also we had to deliberately get students to reflect on this information and give them uh, some guide guidelines to think about the data to nudge them towards improvement to help them in their learning. Uh, so all these tools are technical pedagogy design, considering different theories, and they focus not only on uh, the content in academic content, but also lifelong learning skills. Uh, but throughout, what I could, I would say is that the I, I did talk about the the role of the learner uh, educator also. Uh, actually, the educator the teacher was very much involved in this whole process. So they play a key role in facilitating the learners' learning. And so the educator also used, it was the one who decided, okay, I can use this tool for my students' learning. So the educator itself must be willing to cultivate these uh, related skills, both for data literacy, the usage of the tool, as well as that, that enabling or facilitating attitude of being, one, of being willing to use evidence-informed practices. So I think these are some reflection points uh, where you are as a of educators. And if you want to know further information, these are uh, useful links about the tools. And, uh, yeah, and then thanks to my team, uh, various team of people who were involved in the project uh, along the way. Um, so that brings me to the end of my sharing. Uh, just enough time for Q&A. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, any, any questions? Quick questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. Great question. Thank you. Uh, so I, I I know I didn't really show the pictures, but many of uh, these projects all happened also during the pandemic. Uh, that's why I mentioned it, it can happen uh, online, virtual also, yeah. as well as uh, in a hybrid uh, blended way. So we read our, during the pandemic, it, we read many of our interventions happened during the pandemic, where it was purely on Zoom uh, or whichever online medium the teacher chose. So uh, yes, they were able, so all this, because they use technology at the same time, students were able to go on to their, uh, whatever devices that they had uh, at their own time or whichever and, and use uh, these tools. So yes, uh, many of these pedagogies, they transferred across to the, uh, I would say, during the pandemic and now post-pandemic. Uh, so yes, they can happen because uh, I think many of the principles also are quite, uh, I would say, transportable too. They are not only just for face-to-face. -face. In fact, all the, like, the re -read is online, so it's actually an online discussion. Um, yeah, but the teachers' discussion it can be over Zoom or it, yeah. Uh, but we felt that especially for younger learners, uh, it helped to engage them more actually when they are in a face-to-face -face classroom. So I would say in 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 the pure Zoom or uh, online, one of the issues that you might face will be the less. Uh, it will be harder to engage students or uh, get their attention or get their focus. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah. yeah, this gentleman first, and then uh, the gentleman again. Thank you. My name is Arifin from Indonesia. Uh, do you do the, the, the work you did in the uh, virtually, or you, you have to have uh, some kind of uh, meeting uh, with the facilitators? Uh, and then the second question is how big is uh, ideally a team members? Yeah. And how big is the group? And do you have a leadership, or the facilitator have to be there all the time? And, and then the third question is about. Freeriders. Do you find any freeriders and how to avoid them? Thank you. Thank you for your four questions. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So um, 
So I think you're talking about instructors, the instructors who are the facilitators in that sense. Uh, yeah, it's very important to meet them either any way that you can meet them, face to face or online. So we had a couple of sessions with the teachers. Um, for the teams itself, uh, the teams were maximum six in the team. Uh, uh, yeah, I would say seven in the literature is known as the, the for a team who's doing uh, this kind of work, uh, that's a project. I think it was seven would be the maximum, but typical team size is three to seven people, uh, three to seven in, in that team. Yeah, but definitely you can have more, but there'll be more free riders in, in, if you have larger than seven people. So in our teams, um, yes, I would say any team, there might be some free riders. So, uh, but this way of trying to get students to monitor their own learning and to help each other out actually tries to reduce that, the number of free riders. Yeah, so I know I, I didn't answer all your questions, but I hope this is enough. Yeah. We we'll quickly take this question because I know in your time that's going to be our last question. Uh, this is my email. If you have any questions, you can email me, and that's my Twitter contact if you wanted to talk to me too. Yes, uh, hello, and thank you again for your wonderful presentation. By the way, I'm Michael from the University of the Philippines, and I have two questions. So, why focus on formative learning analytics mm -hmm. and not on the summative mm -hmm. learning analytics? And second question. How long did it take your entire team to develop the overall learning analytics system? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, so I think I did roughly explain in the beginning um, that summative is at the end, right? So once you do that, uh, the student has left your course or there, there's there's no room, not much room for improvement. But formative, uh, you can uh, you're able to actually help the students improve uh, and get from the feedback. So actually that's uh, where I think greater learning values and the use of learning analytics helps you to give feedback during the formative phase uh, even more. So that's why we focus on that and that's one of the values of using formative learning analytics. And uh, how long did my, uh, did my team... Uh, so this project was over several different years. Uh, I would say my good buddy photography is my second phase of my big project. Uh, so really you can see it was uh, four years was the first project, second project was about Two three years, yeah. So that that's the sort of the time period needed, yeah, for for to develop this. But I would say it's a co design, uh, with different people. And the tool, as you can see, is not so commercial. There are, there's definitely some technical, uh, bugs, but uh, uh but it's, it's workable. It's a workable tool that students can learn with the teacher yeah, in the whole process. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, yeah. So in real time, thank you so much. <laughs> we will. Move. Okay, hi. Uh, so now we're having a moder uh, a session of a panel with very esteemed colleagues. Uh, so thank you for staying for this very interesting uh, panel. And uh, I think all of you, uh, the question we were given in this panel was this very interesting question. Uh, and also really, uh, it could be a bit wide. Uh, could I have the questions just uh, shown for this the panel session? The panel session? Uh, be yeah, basically it's what and how should we teach students now? <laughs> it's a huge question. What and how should we teach uh, students now? So I'll be uh, asking each panelist to share based on their backgrounds, um, some of the, their, their insights about this question. What and how uh, should we teach students now? In our planning, we had said, I said to my unit from the very beginning, okay, we're surviving the emergency remote phase now. We have to plan forward for what we're going to do when we return. We talked at the University of Hong Kong for a long time about blended learning. So what are we going to be blending when we return to campus? Because we, unlike my colleague here from an open university, we were having a chat, we are an on-campus experience for our undergraduates. So what were we going to bring forward? So that was my thinking. Then last November, <laughs> ChatGPT was launched. Okay, and now we are in serious policy discussions across the university, hosting multiple forums, working very much to try to generate policy on the fly, as they say, ready for next semester. 
in a period where a student can enter into ChatGPT a very clever prompt to say, write a 3,000 word essay on X and it will generate a 3,000 word essay that will probably pass your subject, okay? So all of a sudden we've got a new tsunami hitting us in education and we're tired. So my first thing to say is be kind to your staff. Be kind to your colleagues and yourselves because we are at yet another emergency phase as we move into um, generative AI and what it means for us at all levels of schooling, okay? So be kind, smile, be nice to each other. That's my first thing. So I guess that goes into my list, Elizabeth, <laughs> because the first point is... What, what do we need? We need to focus on humanity and human creativity. Now, humanity is, is us understanding ourselves as human beings and having human agency. But in a period where you take something, like these large language models like chat GPT, and we know generative AI is developing a whole lot of new models, right? It's not just chat GPT. But if we think about these large language models, they're working off existing text, right? Fundamental principle, they're working off existing text. As we educate the next generation, do we want them to just be feeding off original, off existing text, or do we want those people who will create the next round of texts that these models will feed off, right? So fundamentally, are we creating learners who are able to generate new ideas, right? And generate new texts that these models will feed from. So you get my, get my sense of where I think we have to build human creativity. Elizabeth's given us lots of examples about inquiry-based learning, which I'm a big fan of. Um, another issue in all of this is are we building our students' skills in oracy, okay? Their oral communication. So we're noticing now that our students are coming back to campus we're asking them to do a collaborative task, such as the work that Elizabeth's just been sharing, and they will sit side by side and text each other. <laughs> okay, so we need to really work on their interactional skills as humans, sorry, interactional skills as humans in this new world, all right? They've been home, isolated, online, and now they're physically embodied in classrooms, we hope. Okay, very quickly, I just got the two-minute signals. Gee, I speak for a lot. Uh, so number two, we have to have curricula that address global issues, all right? Environmental sustainability education, climate change education. How do we do it? We build impact-based educational models through inquiry, invention, education. We need curriculum coherence. In the learning sciences, we have a constant raging debate about What's basic knowledge? What do they need to know before they can engage in inquiry? We still haven't resolved that, just new papers out now. So we have to think about um, building curricula that have um, authentic, not token learning experiences, not touristic experiential learning, but deep, sustained experiential learning. A big challenge out to you, a big idea. Why are we going back to our normal structures with schooling? Haven't we just had teachers and parents partner together in new ways much more deeply, much more routinely than ever before? Why don't we have a four-day school week? And why don't we let generative AI take the mundane tasks from our office working parents and they spend an extra day with their kids doing projects with their children? Why not? Why, why not break open the system? It's the time we can if we're not too tired. Um, and those are probably my big points. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Bridges, for, uh, yeah, in short, she had three big points, <laughs> which I think she'll recap some of the points later, so don't worry. Uh, and next, we have uh, Prof. Aslam to uh, share a bit more. Prof. Aslam Khan.
thank you, Dr. Elizabeth. And a uh, very good m morning, I should say, from uh, Malaysia. Yeah. And uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we are looking at a very interesting uh, question there. What and how should we teach students nowadays? Eight words, but I think we have to answer in 8,000 words because it is more than whatever is written there. So firstly, we need to understand. Okay, seven minutes, yeah? We need to understand. Education is about, I think I like to quote mine really, education needs to shift from teaching us facts to teaching us how to live extraordinary lives. Are we doing this? That's a question, yeah? Rhetorical question, no worries. And then, are we basically, as educationists, a reflective practitioner? I'm just sharing some rhetorical questions for us to reflect. Are we reflective practitioners? That's another thing, all right? And then we are looking at how do we align to this education transfer, I would say transformation framework and shift? I think the pandemic has awakened a lot of us, policymakers, practitioners, and everyone, even families or communities. You see, when we talk about uh, you know, uh, education, researchers, many years, I mean, Doing a research is not easy. I think uh, Dr. Elizabeth Koh has uh, elaborated just now. We base it on lots of experiences, lots of researches. We come up with concepts, frameworks that we should, that we should, you know, uh, abide by, right? We talk about Education 4.0, right? We talk about IR 4.0. It started in 2000 and 2001. Now we are in 2023, but nobody really took serious understanding of this until the pandemic came into our lives. Then everybody thought, hey, hey, have we forgotten? Education 4.0, IR 4.0, 21st century education with the six C's, but I put in six C's plus one. I created the one because it's contextualization. Because education is never, never a one hat fits all. We go to schools, we have the curriculum. Every school in Malaysia has the curriculum, right? The syllabus. But the way we teach, our pedagogical approaches may differ. But uh, this is very serious. Education is basically outcome-based. You can take the train, you can take the boat, you can take the bicycle or tricycle, but destination is there, the outcome. So this is something that we need to understand. So this is my pledge to all educationists. Whatever framework, conceptual frameworks, concepts that has been put forward by educationists, by researchers. We need to conceptualize it, internalize it, and then realize it. And then you are the educationist. Then you make a difference to the world and you change lives through education. But not to worry. You'll never walk alone, as Leopold says. Right? Liverpool football team. You'll never walk alone. We are all educationists. We have to work together for the betterment of education for humanity. So let's align ourselves. When we go to the classroom, we align ourselves to IR 4.0, Education 4.0, and 21st century education. All right? Now, there's something that I'd like to share. When we talk about Transformation, all right? Transformation of education in terms of framework, all right? We modernize teaching and learning, keeping abreast with current developments in approaches, pedagogy, resources-based 
on research. Personalized teaching to embrace individualization and difference, difference, we say differentiation, all right? Engage learning. Learning matters most. It's not the teaching. You can be the best teacher. But if learning doesn't take place, then I'm not sure what's happening among the students. And then we talk about collaboration. We need to have collaborative endeavor. Involvement of the school, the management team, teachers, parents, and never forget the community. Now the stakeholders, you see, sometimes parents send the children to school. Okay, please educate them. But they forgot. The parents have a great role. The community has a ro great role. I went to a place where, you know, the connectivity is so not that good. We're talking about technology. I am one person who believes that we have to embrace technology. There's a tagline there. Technology cannot replace teachers. However, teachers with technology will replace teachers without technology. There's a clear point there, right? So we need to understand that the community plays a very important role to ensure that technology is taken to a new level among students, especially in rural areas, all right? Questions are always asked. I come from a school which has very, I should say, very little in terms of connectivity. So how do I go about technology? There's always a solution. There's always a solution, even though a school doesn't have good internet connection, uh, uh, you know, connection or connectivity. There is a solution. We have to sit down. We have to think because solutions are always there if we put our heart and soul because this is education. Remember that we change lives and make a difference through education. Thank you very much because time is up. I have lots of things to share later. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks Prof Aslam Khan. Yes, for that, uh, you never walk alone. So <laughs> we'll continue this, uh, this, this, uh, this, this panel discussion. Now we have Prof Elixir Ramos, who's also Professor X <laughs> for short. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, you know, in, in response to the question, uh, I also framed a question. And it starts with, are we preparing our kids for this future? You see, our kids are very different from us when we were kids, when we were in school. And yet, the problem is most schools have remained the same. You know, I have a 10-year-old son. You give him a phone, and he can do a lot more things with that phone, with that device, you know, in a matter, in a matter of minutes than I could in a matter of days. And yet, we don't allow our children to use their devices in school. So... The problem, basically, with our schools is not that they are not what they used to be, but they are still what they used to be. So, you know, I, I, I echo the, the points of our uh, two other panelists here that, you know, learning by mass production does not cut it. We cannot do it that way. Uh, you know, the pandemic, just like what they said, was actually a wake-up call for all of us. We still use uh, you know, the chalkboard. And then when the pandemic hit, everyone had to shift and learn how to teach in a new learning environment. But the reality is even if the World Health Organization has declared that the pandemic is over, we're not sure if there will be another one. And are we ready for that kind of a future, especially in education? I've always believed that uh, technology is the way to break the 50 students per one teacher ratio, especially in a country like ours in the Philippines, where when you talk about educational reform, it's always a question of how many classrooms are we going to build, how many teachers are we going to hire, without really looking at, are this really the priority needs at this time? 
uh, just like the point that was echoed earlier, what about areas where connectivity is very poor? How do we reach out to them? Now, because for me, you know, the school should be lifelong and life-wide, meaning all the waking hours of a student can be an opportunity for learning. May it be in the family, may it be in their church, you know, uh, especially in their school. So every context is a learning environment. That is, I think, what we should be doing. How do we empower our parents to become teachers as well at their own homes? That's why I've, I've always had this conflict about how do you define homework? Is it something that can really be done at home with the parents? I mean, especially if the parents were not able to finish school and then you give them a homework on calculus and then you ask the parents to help the kids. How can they help them when they don't they themselves don't also know about it? Okay? So we also have to rethink how we do tasks and give work to our students. How do we empower them? How do we engage them? And uh, I think uh, especially in this forum where there are you know technological solutions that are available, we should re really take a serious look on it, especially because our kids nowadays, just like what I said, are very, very much different. You know? They like games. They like to use their devices. They like to use the gadgets. And uh, these are, this is an opportunity for us to actually rethink how we, as educators, you know, relate to our students. Okay? And that's very true. Uh, you know, technology cannot replace teachers, but you know, what we need now are teachers that are digital natives, those who are actually able to embrace technology because that's the only way for us to go, especially at this day and age. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Prof. Uh, Ramos. So I think we've heard from three of them uh, what and how we should teach students uh, nowadays. If I do a quick summary, I think some of you have already pointed out um, to do with technology, the skills to, to navigate this technological world, be it uh, using whatever phone devices or even the new generative AI like ChatGPT. Um, so that's one of the key uh, ways how, the, how they're going to navigate and then bring it in how, right? How I think many of them sh shared to do with the home environment or the environment where they live in as some of the context where we can teach or uh, help our learners learn and bring in parents uh, in some way in their, involved in their teaching. Uh, but we also know there are certain challenges. I think many of them have highlighted some of the challenges. And I think one I would like to touch on is to do with the, the idea of, uh, especially of course technology, to first to get access to technology, first you need some resources, be internet uh, access. That's one, uh, that's one important uh, resource that some of us might not have so easily available, even in Singapore or whichever context you are. Um, so, so, and some of it would be the actual device, the tool itself. So access to technology is one of the challenges, which I would just like the panelists to just see a bit more and also talk about some of the solutions that they see as a sustainable way to help in this, uh, to address this. Uh, so any panelists can take up this uh, challenge of just this question about uh, access to technology and how could we help uh, students or teachers or learners to actually, uh, it's a possible solution in your context. Yeah, anybody? Well, let me just start. Uh, the, the Philippines has 7,000 plus islands. Uh, very, some of these islands are actually very remote and access to a good connection is actually very limited. So uh, one, one possible solution that we're actually working on is actually you know, developing learning content that you can put on a stick that you could just plug in and then that can be shared with the students. And even the assessment can actually be done through it. And then you don't have to have a stable connection all the time. When there is a connection, that's the only time that you can upload these uh, materials. You know? So that's that's one that's one uh, possible solution, uh, especially for very remote and rural areas. Uh, but the question there really, and this has actually been a very big task, especially for teachers when the pandemic hit. How do you create very good content? 
uh, in in the Philippines, what what we did, you know, there was one there's there was this one school that actually started doing away with textbooks and giving tablets to the students. But my my beef there when that was done was you just actually replaced a 10 pound bag <laughs> filled with the uh, textbooks with a two pound uh, actually tablet, but you just digitize the textbook. So the question there is really the content that would actually be able to engage our our learners. That I think that's the bigger issue, developing it, because you can always save it like in a USB and share it with the students. So that's that's one that's one possible solutions in areas where connection is very limited. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, just to add on, I think all of us need to conceptualize that teaching must prepare learners to learn beyond the classroom. All agree, right? Okay, when we talk about technology, okay, when we embark on technology, they, we need to understand there are three main challenges. Okay? Technological challenges, operational challenges, human challenges. Okay? So we need to have a strategic plan. All the ste stakeholders, technology is available. We always have to understand that technology is a means to an end. It's not the end. It's a means to the end in education. All right? So we all need to sit down and come up with a very strategic plan. Now, I think educators play a very important role because we need to shift our mindset. We're talking about uh, you know, embracing the change. And this is something that you know, I like to share. How do we change the pedagogical aspect? Because technology can be brought into the classroom in teaching. So how do we change? All right? Just give me one minute. Let me share with you this based on research. Yeah? When we shift our mindset in pedagogy, we need to understand filling the vessel in the 21st, 20th century, but now it is Kindling the fire. See the concept of you know, pedagogy. We are about retelling in the 20th century, but now we are discovering. Information transfer, but now we are learning to learn. It's time-based, but now it is outcome-based. Textbook-driven, no, it's research-driven. Passive learning, no, it is active learning now. So when we embrace this shift, in the pedagogical perspective, if we bring in technology, I think we have a great answer. So all the stakeholders, let's sit down and find a solution. There's definitely a solution. Definitely a solution. We'll talk about this later on. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, towards that solution, uh, I guess we want to put our heads together <laughs> to, towards the solution. Uh, but one quick thing I, I would say from, from my side um, would be, uh, I think in the what I shared earlier was like getting students, um, giving them feedback is actually one way of getting them more interested to learn also because they, they get feedback about their learning and helping them to motivate them in their learning. So the educators do play a role, a key role in helping to motivate students if some students are not so motivated. And so that kind of helps if there's, access issues or whatever issues, if the students are a bit more motivated to learn, the students will find ways to overcome those issues in that sense. So, so in a sense, give, give the solution back to the learner. That's one of my, my pivots towards, towards that, that question. Yeah, so I guess towards the, the, some of the solutioning, would you have any suggestions or in general of, of how can we continue to help our learners learn in this post-pandemic world, especially with technology? Any thoughts? I mean, I think Elizabeth's work on um, the computer-supported collaborative learning inquiry base where we're actually using the technology to support the process, that's very important. We're also thinking very much about student wellness. You know, so all of us are very concerned about um, student mental health, student well-being. It's a 
very hot topic. We're seeing it in the classrooms. We're seeing at the policy level how we're going to support. So there's lots of debates about how technology can help us with student wellness, right? Um, and we're internally debating things like, for example, learning management system analytics and, and do you have wellness nudges, et cetera. You know, so you have a little nudge message that comes out, are you doing okay, we haven't heard from you for a while, et cetera. Is that just going to be an irritant, a trigger? Is it going to be supportive or helpful? Do we need alerts for teachers? Are we being too much of a nanny? In a high, I'm thinking the higher education context. So we know there's a concern. I don't think there's an easy technological solution because these are human problems that need human conversations and time with students. Uh, we actually just gave an award for a, for a student-led service initiative. Our students were very concerned about each other and caring for each other during our online period. We had one group of students start a text-based online helpline, we had our, of course, our institutional helplines running from 10 p.m. till 5 a.m. And students could text in and get support from another student. It was overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly impressive, not only the dedication of the students to man that at those hours when I prefer to be asleep, but also to engage those students in really helpful ways, just with text messaging and being there. So there's something there about wellness and technology that we haven't really captured yet or addressed, and I'm not sure where we'll go. Challenge out to our technology colleagues. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for adding that part about uh, helping us to remember that it's not a uh, overly <laughs> cognitive uh, world in a sense. It, there's a lot of well-being, especially which is post-pandemic, uh, many of the mental stress, other kind of stresses that come into also related to equity and resources. Um, so any other suggestions? Any, uh, Prof Aslam, you're mentioning you are working towards that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, one of the uh, solutions that I see, I think it is for teachers, you know, those who are really involved or education, you say, uh, we need to have a you know a short term plan, mid term plan, and long term plan, because sometimes we need to understand that you know, in terms of governance, we may have certain uh, you know factors there which uh, you know hold us back this and uh, you know uh, for doing certain things. But I would suggest the contextualization. Uh, this is something that uh, I like to share that. As educationists, contextualize and justify in a professional manner your selection of your pedagogical models that you have used and your resources, okay, your resources based on availability and also look at the learning styles of your learners Okay, the socio-economic status of your learners, all right, and the availability of the resources that you think you know best, and then you contextualize it in the maximum manner based on whatever technology that you have at your disposal and teach. As simple as that. And then I think all your learners will get exactly what they are supposed to get from you. If you start thinking, you know, having this mindset of contextualizing everything that you're doing in education with your learners, then that's a very safe endeavor. All right? So technology is there but you are the master. You're the master. You're not the servant to technology. Yeah? Remember that. You're the master. You maximize it. But of course, you need to have professional development. So this is where I think it's all interconnected. You never walk alone. I always say that. Yeah, thank you.
can I quickly jump in on, that's a great segue to professional development, because we're actually doing a lot with the notion of students as partners, okay? So we talk about students as partners in higher education. Um, again, a student-initiated project during the pandemic, the online period, where some of our final year students in medicine were very concerned about the first years. They approached us and said, can we do some kind of professional development for the senior students so we can help our junior peers? So we developed this as a small module with only about 15, 16 students. The Faculty of Medicine has now picked this up. They're calling it the Near Peer Tutor Scheme. And now we're at the point where we're developing it into a full course for these students and they're going to get, um, if they wish, apply for associate fellowship with the advanced HE. So they'll actually come out of their medical degree with a teaching certification. So we're very excited to work with students as partners, help them to help us because the problems are so large, we teachers alone cannot solve them. Yeah, thanks. So we have uh, teacher PD as well as students being part of that PD and vice versa. Yeah, uh, do you have anything to add for, for us? Well, yeah. uh, I think one of the important things as well is there should be a champion, mm. yeah, especially in educational uh, reform. Uh, in the Philippines right now, uh, we just convened the second Congressional Commission on Education, which is tasked to actually create policy reforms in education. And I was sharing with my fellow panelists that the, the situation in the Philippines is quite, quite unique because we have a trifocalized educational governance. We have one agency in charge of TVET, another one for basic education, another one for higher education. But the problem is, and this was also shared by uh, Dr. Akam here, that in our country, these agency heads don't talk to each other. So, so that's that's a challenge. So you need someone to actually champion reforms. You know, we, we can talk about the importance of technology, the importance of training teachers, the importance of, uh, of uh, the students and parents, but if the policymakers will not support it and will not champion it, then we won't really get anywhere. So it has to be a total ecosystem, you know, from, from government uh, policymakers, to uh, uh, educational uh, institutions, industry, parents, uh, the students. It has to have a total buy-in effort. Mm. Thanks for that. Yeah, I, I believe all of us uh, in every field that from even from a student to the next level, in a sense, the organization to the policy level, is, is very important that all this has to be somewhat aligned and, and somewhat interested in this in the same goal and talk to each other. So that's very, very important. Uh, we're heading towards the next section, but before we go on to the next session, I just invite our panelists to just think about one key like ending point you'd like to share with, the, with our, co our colleagues and audience here uh, to summarize what you have to share about what and how we should teach students nowadays uh, based on what you have shared previously. And so time to so reflect from the audience what, what the key learning you have learned so far. I know there are a lot of rich points that we have shared today. I'll give you a moment just to reflect. And then we'll start with Prof Bridges who's ready. <laughs> So being human, th focusing on um, what the human brings to the technology um, is super important as we think about what we want our students to learn. So what will they as human beings bring to an AI-assisted world, okay? So uh, as creators of content and how will they partner with these things. So I had a medical education uh, colleague several years ago talk about we have to think about partnering with robotics, partnering with systems. Instead of teaching our students how to do the basics of the system, you take that as assumed knowledge and then you work on the process of how they partner with that system. That's a different way of thinking about what is basic knowledge how you partner with the system. So partnering with AI, what do we give up in our curricula? What must we push forward as we move into this new era? 
Yeah, I w- I would say this, my parting words, yeah, because the most important thing is that we have to keep abreast with the latest development, and also we need to align education with global needs. So that's why you say what we are teaching and how we are teaching. It is for the global needs. So on that note, education is. We need to have that uh, you know mindset shift. The education landscape has shifted, so we have to embrace it, and then we have to keep ourselves abreast with global needs. So what we are teaching, how we are teaching, has to be like that. It has to be aligned to whatever global needs really need, you know. So and that's in that sense, and education is teachers or professors, who, whoever you are, we have to remember, we are the frontliners. Our pedagogical approaches need to be something very current. It has to be like that. So I will be very happy to say that initiatives should come from the educationists. Empowerment should be given to educationists. We empower you. So give your best, nothing but the best to the learners. God willing, inshallah, they will get the best. So that's how we answer the question, what and for with our students. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to read some some bullet points that I also prepared you know, as, as parting words. You know. our, our, our students nowadays are have diverse learning needs and learning styles, they have different learning paces and they have different interests. So the challenge there really for all of us as educators and as managers of educational institutions and leaders in our own rights is to actually embrace that change. We have, we have, to, we have to admit that the system right now the society right now, the environment right now has changed very differently from when we were students and when we first started as teachers, you know, speaking to, you know, the group that I have here being educators. So we have to really, you know, make that effort also to be champions of change and adapt to, you know, the changing environment, the changing uh, system and, uh, in education, because if we don't continue to do that, and if we don't change, then again, I'll go back to my question earlier, then we won't be preparing our kids for the future. Thank you. So with this, uh, we are ending our panel uh, with what and how to teach, we should teach students nowadays as we are humans, uh, we need to partner each other to work together. Uh, and and to embrace the changes that uh, that's going to happen. Uh, so that's uh, my quick way of trying to summarize this panel on what and how we should teach students nowadays. So thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues. If you want to do a bit of moving and shake about to wake up, first of all, by all means. <laughs> it's uh, It's been a busy morning. Um, well, I was kind of lucky. I took up a directorship. I was unlucky because I took up directorship of a centre under the president's office that's in charge of teaching and learning across the university, teaching and learning support across the university. Um, the minute that were the um, that we had campus closures start, so that was kind of unlucky but exciting. Then I was lucky because the first management meeting I went to with um, the Pro Vice Chancellor who has all the money for estates, big Excel sheet on the on the wall saying, okay, you've been allocated funds to create um, from the University Grants Council, not the not just our university, to create a showpiece Hong Kong special administrative region learning space. That was not in my job description. <laughs> so I started with 
okay, how do we transition to only online learning to also how do we think about a new learning space when we return to campus? Okay, and so that was something that I alluded to just before and really set me on a whole new pathway. What also in my reading while we've been going through this very strange journey of trying to predict what a classroom of the future might look like, while we were in that, we were also thinking about the future readiness that Elizabeth just talked about and what we're seeing as new work patterns. So we had a terrific forum by one of our NGOs in Hong Kong called Esperanza. And Esperanza brought in these folk who were doing global assessments of new wor workforces. One of the guys from India was looking at tech support and looking at new modes of work during tech support. We can't hire tech support to sit on campus and be instructional designers, right? They're distributed all over the world. What these guys found was that the tech guys were moving to the old tourist spots that were abandoned during the pandemic and they were actually gathering there and working remotely from all of these new places in the world. So they're working in very distributed remote physically remote locations, but remote in terms of remote work. And so those teams were already collaborating in very new ways. And then some of colleagues in higher education said, should we be preparing students for remote and distributed teamwork as we see the practice of work changing? Right? People are moving out of cities and moving to rural locations or regional locations or surfside locations and saying, I can just do everything, work from home and, and Zoom. Why do I have to drive and commute into the city and do um, the, the big transit into the city? People are rethinking fundamentally their work practices. Challenge. How do people work effectively in these distributed patterns when we know that those conversations in physically located areas are so important? So anyway, we at the University of Hong Kong decided that we were going to think about the biggest challenge, which was hybrid learning environments, synchronous hybrid learning environments. So a quick recap. We're an English medium, research-led, large, comprehensive university. Uh, we extend our campus is reasonably tightly located. I was um, at uh, Griffith University. We had the Southeast Australia Corridor when I was a research fellow. Um, but we still extend across Hong Kong and the Greater Bay Area, and there's a lot of work going on and expanding our presence in Shenzhen, Guangzhou, et cetera. 10 faculties, around 32,000 students. Our undergrads are majority local kids coming through the local school system into our university. So it's very different from many other models because it's quite a coherent group. They're young, they're straight out of high school. Uh, we have a small percentage of international students in that undergraduate group and a small percentage of mainland um, China students coming into that group. But that's, you know, only about 20% of them. Our postgraduates, large proportion coming from mainland China. So we have very different undergrad and postgraduate and in the talk postgraduate space. Our staff profile, about 8,052% of professoriate. My centre is a central unit um, funded under the Pro Vice Chancellor Teaching and Learning and um, we work across all the faculties. Our job is professional development. I have a programs team who are working on um, staff development courses. We've just launched a brand new certificate course. Uh, we have about 500 to 600 research postgraduate students go through the compulsory course in our centre. So they're not allowed to teach as teaching assistants unless they've done our centre course, right? So we have a, a large volume from a very small teaching team. Then we run seminars and workshops. My colleague Cecilia Chan runs the um, 
the innovation and support team and they ran Education 4.0 for us in the midst of what are we all going to do pivoting online. We had over a thousand people attend that session, okay? So we have a really large outreach and a really large responsibility for professional development. So we've had these challenging years. Um, we moved online for social unrest in Hong Kong. So we had campus closures in Hong Kong before the pandemic, which kind of got us a little bit ready in a way, unfortunate way, but it got us a little bit ready. Then, of course, we've had the same experience you've had. We experimented. We experimented in September 2020 between the waves. Um, we thought we would try saying our faculty had to be on campus to deliver an undergrad class particularly for undergrads, right? Taught postgrads were still stuck all around the world. Our undergrads were mostly local. So, okay, teachers, you have to be on campus. The students can opt. If they want to come into class, they can. So we said, what's the name for this? And we see lots of language um, developing. We were originally calling it dual mode. And I had um, Dr. Cecilia Chan run into a classroom, a regular classroom and say, try running one session through that. She came back into my office and was like traumatized. Susan, the classroom's not set up for it. I can't do this. I can't communicate the Zoom, the audio. Ah, it's really troublesome. So we recognised this was a really tough point for us returning to campus and trying those models. Uh, we also noticed new patterns of student behaviour. So a student would come to the door, open the door, look inside, oops, not too many people here, close the door and go to another part of campus and join by Zoom. <laughs> so that was kind of interesting. Our learning common space, which was originally designed with the principle of Starbucks meets shopping mall meets library. That, those were the three design principles they had when we built our new learning commons in 2012. So these students who shut the door, they were going to the learning commons and sitting with their friends, zooming into class. Okay, that's interesting. So the teacher's in the room, the students are in a social space joining in. They're also in Starbucks or coffee academics in Hong Kong. They're also in these other spaces. I walked behind one student who was actually walking along with her laptop in a class <laughs> and I was going from one end of the campus to the other and she was listening and engaged with a class, a live class, moving from one part of campus. Our students were so mobile. All right. So our teachers were like, well, nobody's coming. I'm in, a, I'm in this room and they're all Zooming from all over the place. So that was an interesting, interesting moment where we said this synchronous hybrid stuff is challenging from the room perspective, challenging from the student engagement perspective. But we did all of the usual things that many of you did. You, we helped people to design online learning. I created a process in the inter-semester period called the Sandbox got very, very zen with our sandbox and uh, uh, notions of trying to get teachers into a creative space, a dialogic creative, let's think about how we're going to redesign our courses, our assessments, our pedagogies for online. And so we, were, we continue that as an inter-semester sandbox period. Okay, our own professional development, well, look at where our registrations went just in that short period. So we went from, um, you know, registrations 18, 19, 1,522. This is voluntary registrations, not the compulsory courses. Moving up to then 70% online and uh, up to 3,000 and we were 100% online with over 6,000 registrants in the year 2021. All right, so we were really busy. <laughs> Whoa, and I've just switched everything off. Okay. What's interesting, we also commissioned this group, EAB. I don't know if you know them. They're a, they're a very large group of consultants. Uh, and they've been very interesting because they scope new trends across um, uh, higher education. So they've been very interesting. And this is from their website. I double checked it um, just before I came. So uh, they were looking at technology enabled classrooms and polling, all right, and talking about, well, what are you, um, what, what are these portfolios for technology enabled classrooms? So 82% of institutions were planning to upgrade the technology for active learning. 
59% plan to add flexible design features in their normal lecture rooms. 59% plan to optimise for high flex delivery. Okay, so in particularly North America, they're talking about this notion of synchronous hybrid as high flex. And these are the sorts of things they're doing, ceiling mounted mics, multiple monitors, green rooms, we've had those for a while. Um, group table seating, you'll see what I did with my team to try to get around this. The video audio at your table, how does that integrate? Uh, interestingly, some designs went for this 360. So you kind of had, you know, those ice hockey, basketball, central giant screens and, the, and then the podium around, very Greek theatre feel to it, but still very much teacher on the stage. So we, we didn't go that direction. So where have we been? My own history, I started with the University of Hong Kong 15 years ago. I'm getting my first long service award next, uh, next week. Um, and it was actually with the Faculty of Dentistry. So I, I had someone approach me and say, I'm sorry, I'm not a dentist. They said, no, 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 we want educationists to join us because we have a curriculum reform. We want someone who can also help us with e-learning. And I said, well, I'm not a technologist, but I play around. And they said, no, we want you to work on this. So I joined them. Fantastic experience working with a very niche, bespoke, elite program that used inquiry-based, problem-based learning, all right? So I learned so much about clinical teaching. I learned so much about problem-based learning as a curriculum design. And we actually unpacked it and put it all back together. So it was a fabulous few years with dentistry. So we were co-constructing research. This is a project with Professor um, C.H. Chu, some of our second year students. We were already doing an online international peer review project back then, and that project still continued. Lots of work on e-learning at the University of Hong Kong, which helped put us in a pretty good space for thinking about how we wanted to teach online. And lots of work with collaborating and co-constructing curricula with an interdisciplinary focus. So lots of the work has been in problem-based learning and inquiry-based learning. I moved from dentistry after about five years, I moved back to my home faculty and became assistant dean in faculty of education. I chaired the curriculum reform group for our um, postgraduate diploma in education, which is UGC funded, University Grants Council funded, highly selective. We have a couple of hundred places. Usually we process two and a half to three and a half thousand applicants per year. It's a highly competitive program. Total redesign, it took us three years of redesigning. Then I stayed with it for another three years as assistant director to help the fine tuning. The point we made earlier, curricula are dynamic processes. Never think of a curriculum as a static thing, okay? It's a dynamic process. So you have to stay committed to that revision and that revision process. A reform isn't just a hand it on a platter. A reform is an ongoing process. So the logic I worked with, I was also um, chair of the um, American Education uh, Research Associates Special Interest Group on problem-based education. We, we've changed the name to problem-based and project-based learning. Um, and so we've got this notion of the philosophical notion about inquiry and how we're going to structure a curriculum and structure pedagogy around inquiry um, and how the classroom pedagogy works, how someone facilitates, okay? So as an ethnographer, I've always been very interested in classroom processes, okay? And as someone with an applied linguistics background, I've always been interested in language and how classroom talk develops inquiry, develop students' understanding. So this is this image on the on the, the cartoon was something that my colleague um, Dr. John Dyson in his introduction to PBL sessions 20 years ago used to use to say who's the teacher in the room, to really illustrate how we've got students very actively engaged in taking the lead, all right, fostering autonomy. So my challenge was how did I 
continue working with an existing successful model that it was over 10, 12 years old and bring it into an E model, okay? And so we wanted to think about bring, building flexible knowledge, but we wanted to think about the room designs. So one of my earliest projects was redesigning the PBL suites, bringing in interactive whiteboards, thinking about collaborative tools, introducing professional development and student work. Okay, we won an award with QS Wharton um, and they put us in an interesting category called presence learning, right? So that was an interesting category, being present. We talk about being present and in the moment. So how are we present in a technology-infused moment? So we wanted to help our students navigate and connect to information flows. So we're actually at this moment with ChatGPT, we're actually at a similar inflection point. Back then, I had PBL medical educators say, I ban laptops from rooms. They can't have laptops because the whole point is to have conversations. And I'm like, yeah, but they're going to be accessing the internet when they get out of the room. How are we going to channel that through our own pedagogies and dialogue? So we thought about this ubiquitous access to information, right? How are, the, how are we going to have that embedded in the process. And the kinds of new multimodal texts. Elizabeth talked about multiliteracies before. How do they engage with multimodal texts? My colleagues did fascinating things with technology. So Dr. Yankee Yang um, worked with a company to do 3D models. And in those 3D models, the students could manipulate them, do planning, measurements, et cetera, and then work through a patient plan. All right, so we were doing all of that stuff pre-pandemic. It was very forward thinking. I, my um, research area, I'm not going to go into depths with this because you want to see what the room looks like, but just to let you know, I said I was an ethnographer, interactional ethnographer. We trace with video analysis, text analysis, what's going on in the classroom over time. So this is the kind of work I do and this is uh, in the learning sciences. Very important, Elizabeth also mentioned the notion of dialogic education. Professor um, Rupert Wegriff from Cambridge has um, run a group on dialogic education, so thinking about talk and technology. We often don't make that connection. We use technology to help us talk to people, but how do we have conversations with technology embedded? Okay, so at EdTech, as a tool for opening up and resourcing the kind of dialogic spaces that enable people to think, learn, and play together. I really love that. If they can think, learn, and play. That whole point I made before about generative AI and creativity, I still think dialogic approaches are one way for us to look at that. And he also said higher order thinking, and we always talk about higher order thinking as that area we want our students to reach, is that distinctive, is, sorry, is thinking that is distinctively human. Remember my arguments before. It's responsive, creative and unpredictable thinking that originates in dialogues. So how are we going to support ourselves in this dialogic approaches in techno with technology? So this is an old piece I did where we had the same PBL problem in a room where on the right-hand side for the very first time the teacher allowed laptops in the room. And it was chaos. <laughs> and they were all trying to say, all right, did you find the website? Had lots of technology supporting the dialogic process, but it was chaotic. So I introduced an interactive whiteboard with the scribe linked to the whiteboard. And then all of a sudden, we've got collective collaboration and dialogue around a single large screen. Sounds pretty simple. The, the next piece, was something that we've just published um, uh, in 2020, and I brought up this concept of dialogic intervisualizing. All right, so how do we create a collaborative visual object through talk? So that's where my research in this one was looking. This is a, a PBL group in medical education, and we traced the students over three weeks, three sessions, plus interviews, et cetera, and looked at how the teacher was talking the students through 
accessing and creating images. So we could then track that to the problem-based learning cycle. And we could see that we went from a first artifact, the first visual was when a student in the first tutorial was trying to explain the structure of a heart. And the others said, can you just draw it? And then he went up and he drew four squares and said, well, there's four chambers in the heart. I'm not, I'm not draw drawing this very well. Then we went into conversation about, can someone find a good image of the heart? And then we were searching and throwing up images. And then they talked about this. And they started generating hypotheses for the case, et cetera. I can't talk you through the whole process. But by the end, the learning outcome, the learning outcome for it was actually for students to draw this graph. <laughs> that was the student learning outcome. So they went through all these different visual objects, including searching up YouTube videos to support listening to the change in beat in a heart. It was a heart problem, okay? So we could see this process of through dialogue, through guiding the students through both curating and creating texts. We got there. So that's a face-to-face -face process. Here's another massive Massification, big problem with problem-based learning is that it's small group and teacher facilitated. Everyone says, how do I do it at scale? It's too expensive. I can't hire that many teachers to be facilitating at once. This is an, a foray into team-based learning. Team-based learning, interprofessional team-based learning, 300 to 500 students, 13 programs across Hong Kong, meeting for three hours on a Saturday morning uh, with a whole process that has an online system that follows through the process while the students are also physically in randomised groups exchanging and talking and discussing cases, right? So strong structure, lots of work published about that. What fascinated me as a team member after we got it all designed and it's running and I was standing in the room with these perfect configurations and students allocated, but through the three hours, the chairs moved, the configurations moved. And I thought, this is very interesting. We've got a whole environment going on here. And Gruppen, from a medical education perspective, talks about learning environments as living systems. So we heard the word ecosystem before. Interactions across the psychosocial, the personal, the social, organisational dimensions and technology was part of that. So we published that in nurse education there and we thought about this socio-material assemblages in team-based learning. I'm throwing a lot of big words at you. If you like it, throw, have a look at the paper. So <laughs> here I am with money I didn't ask for told to create not only just a new room, a Hong Kong showpiece, special administrative showpiece room. We were given our own space to tear apart and put back together. So we really sat down as a group and said, what were the limitations? Because this already looked pretty cool and spacey. We had these multiple levels. We had screens around the walls. We had all sorts of tech going on. So we thought about the limitations of fixed furniture, we thought about the environmental factors. It was so white and bright. Colleagues had headaches after being in there for a while. And it was certainly not built for this kind of dual mode hybrid existence. So what were we going to do? See, here's another imperative. We wanted to think about how for our professional development, we were going to move beyond the sandwich and seminar approach. That's what I call it. You know, ask colleagues to physically come to a room and have a sandwich with us and have professional dialogues and, and attend a seminar. We could do that in Hong Kong previously, but we're expanding campuses, right? People aren't going to drive from Shenzhen <laughs> to come for a sandwich, okay? Um, and so we also started thinking about the notion of post-digital. Now, I'll introduce that concept more deeply in a minute. So we worked out three premises, just like our learning commons, flat, we tore everything out. We wanted it to be flexible so we could do any kind of pedagogy that a teacher wanted. So the space does not dictate the pedagogy. The teacher dictates the pedagogy. So it can do anything <laughs> that a teacher wants to, but it needs a lot of co-planning. 
Going back to this idea of the post-digital, this is a nice special issue in a young journal. It's a very exciting journal, um, uh, post-digital science and education. Now, this special issue talked about post-digital learning spaces in higher ed. And they said, when students, teachers gather for a class, they are present in multiple spaces. The digital, material, biological and social are co not only connected, but they're co-determining. We know that when we're on, we have a student in their home on Zoom and grandma comes in to have a chat with the kid, there's something else going on. There's a whole new dimension added to that interaction in that classroom. What about when we're teaching our students for adults when they bring the baby into the room. I love it. I always welcome my students, my post postgrads, to bring their babies and children in and we chat to the children and so forth. We had to be very human during that time. So they're all co-connected and co-determining. So we looked at some of the directions being taken in pre-2020. My university is part of Universitas 21 group and in the Universitas 21 group we set up a working group on learning environments um, and I introduced one of our partners is KU Leuven University over in Belgium. Now KU Leuven I think was doing the most interesting thing for trying to connect the teacher with the physical and, and the personal, right? but you still had all of the learners kind of grouped up on a wall here. And I wasn't so keen on that idea of putting them on the periphery, excuse me. Um, also, we were looking at table designs. Again, the table designs, even the most modern ones, you know, and I was going to all the furniture suppliers with my team and the furniture suppliers were showing us things that they were building for Tsinghua, for example. And it was still putting the Zoom person at the end of the table. And I kind of started working with this idea of we have to stop thinking about the learner at the, per the Zoom person, the online person at the periphery. How can we bring them more into the group? Also thinking about these future workspaces. I don't know about your context, but in Hong Kong, there's a whole proliferation of co-working spaces. I was very interested to visit young friends who were working in these spaces. They have a, they have a bar, they have a collective area, and they have hot desks and they pay for time in these co-working spaces. It's generative, it's creative, it's quite fluid, it's an, and it's very eco-sustainable. Wahoo, as well. Do I keep doing that? Sorry, guys. Sorry, what's happened? It's probably me pressing something. I'll let you go. Wow. So thinking about those environmentally sustainable co-working spaces, which is the future, all right? So we had to keep thinking about a future forward learning space that was sustainable and environmentally eco. How are we going? Wow, I really messed that up, didn't I? So, um, so we designed a room where we could have a teacher facilitating Find a room where we could have a teacher facilitating in a large space, but we also wanted to design a room where we could have those PBL style group interactions. We're back on? Fantastic. I promise not to press anything strange anymore. Uh, it was the keyboard. Ha, not me. Right, no problem. Are we going forwards? This is not connecting now. Okay, so this is when we started thinking from a design perspective, how are we going to build this thing? So we started thinking about wraparound screens, all right? Okay, so wraparound screens and these table, breakout tables. But how would the table interact with the screen? How would the groups interact? So this started our thinking. My colleague Cecilia she actually created what we're calling a digital canvas approach instead of LED. I thought we we're going to have LED screens, but we've moved away. So we started with these ideas. We really started thinking about the table, and that was trouble. Nobody in the world was actually making a table that would suit our needs. When I was at the point where I'm drawing plans and asking my staff to go somewhere and have something built, I thought, we'd better go to the patent office 
Now we have a patent. I did not believe that in my 15th year at Hong Kong U that I would actually have a patent in Hong Kong and greater China for a piece of furniture. But that's where we ended up. We had to invent it. Educause picked up this idea, you know, the periphery to the center idea. Educause picked that up as a, as a 2022 position paper case study. Um, they liked this idea. So focus on interactional affordances for seamless physical virtual group collaboration and improve teacher facilitation. That's the core of what we wanted to do. So, ta-da, here it is. What's the final design? Well, that's how we tore it apart. But tearing it apart was also really remember all the audio problems. Everybody said in those rooms from normal classrooms, audibility was a big issue. So we had lots of cladding and padding behind for the audio. We tore everything out and we put everything back together. Um, and what was something that we did with that post-digital idea is to have a living wall. So this wall at the end is not plastic. That is life in the room. So I was really thinking about that post-digital idea about how can we bring a living ecosystem into the room. So you see we've got the large screen affordances. All of those screens have panels. All of those screens have projectors. And all of them can be linked to different tables at different times. What was the hardest thing when you were on Zoom with a class of 120 students in breakouts? Monitoring the breakout activity. I still don't believe, if anyone from Zoom is here, I still don't believe that those guys haven't figured out how we can see all Zoom activity in breakout groups at the same time. So a teacher would jump from group A to group B. Yeah, I'm seeing you do that hop, hop. We're hopping from one to the other. You turn up in a group, even if they are chatting and really good, as soon as you turn up, they go, mm, teacher's here. Right. So it was a really hard thing to monitor and facilitate. On one screen, on one of our panels, I can have every group simultaneously displayed. And I can have their collaborative work simultaneously displayed. So on the hybrid, we're calling it a hybrid learning mobile desk console. On the desk console, we can have students interacting as a group, no audible bleeding to other groups and other room in the room. And we can also then throw a group to the large screen. So that's been something then we've been working out how to work, how to do. But teachers can use it, as I said, flexible any way they like. So we've got um, Dr. Peter Lau teaching some postgrads here with his certificate course. We've got some round table stuff going on. We've got some people on Zoom having a look, having a chat with us. These are our design patents that we've got for it. Um, and this is the synchronous hybrid in action. You can see the Zoom person there. We use a 360 camera in the center. So remember that idea of putting the Zoom people in the middle. So the Zoom person's video feed is actually of the whole group. So they're at the center of the group. The group, the positioning of the screens was tough because you want to be able to see each other and also see the person on the screen. So the group can talk, can chat and talk, and that person feels like they're in the middle of the talk instead of stuck at the end of it. Uh, we did a little survey for, from our U21 leadership group. And one of our colleagues, I actually know this guy, one of our colleagues, always very provocative, always incredibly immersed in ed tech, right? So we're not talking about a Luddite. We're talking about someone who knows ed tech inside out, done lots of the work on learning analytics years ago. And this person said the spaces and the kit, so the technology, the gear, they're interesting, but is the institutional support, the staff support, and the pedagogic, pedagogical challenges that make it more interesting. So we've been working on co-designing with our, with our colleagues and experimenting with the space. So what keeps us excited in this new space? Um, new approaches to teaching and learning, experimenting. As I said, we've just had a second year common core group um, working on um, 
They're doing kind of like a speed dating approach, 30 minutes in the room, in the space, do a collaborative task together. The teacher can see all the collaborative documents and lots of very fast, fast interactions. A student was, I was outside, student came out, I said, how'd you like it? Great. I said, how did you like the, the hybrid? Oh, awesome. And I was like, thank you. My work here is done. <laughs> if I've got a second year undergrad saying that our design and his experience in that moment uh, was awesome, that was, that was super important. So I'm calling it our imaginarium. We're trying to give a space, a creative space for teachers to imagine new possibilities in their pedagogies. We're really focusing on dialogic pedagogies that build teamwork, particularly this notion of synchronous hybrid, the toughest thing to do. Um, and the Learning Lab website's there. There's some uh, little videos and all of our presentations are, are there and on there. And for those tech-minded, as a last little thing, I've got the list of, of the kit. Remember, we just put all of these existing technologies together, right? We didn't invent the technologies. We just figured out what would work best at the table, but we did have to inv invent the table. <laughs> all right, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And we also have um, our Q&A session. Um, does anybody have a question for our guest speaker? Please raise your hand and I'll give you the mic. Any questions? Looks like we have no questions. No, they want to go to lunch. They've been trapped in this room for so long. <laughs> sure, have a, have a chat afterwards. Thank you. So um, thank you again. And we have now come to the end of the session. Again, I would like to thank you all the speakers and panelists for your insightful sharing today. And I hope you found it useful by joining the sessions today. We highly value your feedback and encourage you to share with us your experience by scanning the QR code. You can find the QR code on the screen and also behind the chair. The survey has six questions only and it only takes one minute to complete. So please do so, we really um, appreciate that. And meanwhile, we have prepared food and drinks right outside of the room for all of you to continue the conversations. Again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for att attending today's session. And I see you at the networking session. Thank you.